Okay. So the floor is yours. Important. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah. Let me start. Um, um, yeah, I'm going to talk about polytops and K-theory. I'll start, uh, I'll try to start uh, uh, from the beginning, but uh, if you feel that I'm too fast or too slow, then please, like, yeah, adjust me, like ask questions or tell that I'm too slow or anything like this. So, um, okay. Um, yeah, so let me, I also, I want to say that Okay, maybe in first uh, half it will be the first half of the talk will be kind of preliminary, but in the second half I'll talk about work with Jenny uh, Smirnov, uh, which is very much in progress, and um, that's why like some of things like I'll formulate not full generality and we're really, like some things which can be pushed a bit further, but um, yeah. Anyway, I think it will be fine. Okay, so let me start with uh, a very. Uh, um, a very uh, concrete construction. Uh, it uh, comes from commutative algebra. So um, if you start with a homogeneous polynomial um, on just Rn um, of, let's say, degree d, then you can associate to this homogeneous polynomial in algebra, uh, which is obtained by taking the polynomial ring and partial derivatives. So we have Rn, we have our partial derivatives uh, with respect to our variables, and uh, we can um, take those partial derivatives which uh, completely annihilate our polynomial. Um, so polynomials and our partial derivatives which annihilate uh, polynomials. And uh, they take the quotient algebra uh, of this polynomial ring by the annihilator of the polynomial f. So uh, this polynomial uh, ring uh, in partial derivatives uh, has more invariant description. This is a ring of differential operators with constant coefficients. And uh, for maybe people who are more algebraically uh, minded, this is also can be identified with just symmetric algebra of a vector space. So if we uh, more invariantly, if we work not with Rn, but work with just abstract vector space, um, this polynomial ring, we can, associate, we can identify with symmetric algebra uh, of this vector space V. Um, or like you can think about this as differential operators with constant coefficients, which is... Uh, um, so this is a bit more convenient because, in fact, uh, so I started with a finite dimensional vector space here, but in certain examples, it's more it, it's natural to consider infinite dimensional vector space, and a lot of theory goes uh, goes through. Uh, so you can take infinite dimensional vector space, you can take uh, differential operators with constant coefficients on this uh, infinite dimensional vector space, and you can take some homogeneous polynomial on this infinite dimensional vector space. You can still define this algebra. And uh, everything I'm gonna say will also be true in this particular case. All that today we will mostly uh, we all only need finite dimensional case. So um, okay, so that's very good. We can define this algebra, but uh, uh, turns out that these algebras are quite special. So here are several facts about this algebra AF. So first of all, uh, since we started with homogeneous polynomial F, the uh, the annihilator of this polynomial is a graded ideal. Um, and in particular, the quotient algebra is graded. Uh, so this uh, gradient degree goes up to D, which is a degree of our uh, homogeneous polynomial. Uh, second of all, um, the zero and uh, the top dimensional component um, is isomorphic, is just one dimensional uh, vector space. Um, then uh, another important property, which is maybe like the main property is that this algebra AF uh, satisfies Poincaré duality. So what does it mean? It means that if, if I have an i-th component and d minus i-th component, I have a natural pairing between these two components which just takes uh, a pair of elements a and b and takes their product and multiplies them. So their product uh, belongs to the uh, top degree uh, component of this our algebra, which is a one-dimensional vector space. So we can identify this with uh, uh, our field with R. Um, so, and this is uh, uh, this is a bilinear pairing, and uh, Poincaré duality statement says that it's non-degenerate. So, any algebra which is constructed in this way uh, satisfies Poincaré duality. Well, and finally, this is not 
super important, but just by construction, this algebra is generated in degree one. So we have these uh, four uh, properties. So we have graded algebra, we have a top and uh, top degree component and zero degree component uh, is just one dimensional. We have pancreatality and we have a generation in degree one. So it's like standardly generated algebra. And um, um, there's a theorem which says that actually not just uh, algebra AF uh, satisfies all these four properties, but in fact, any algebra which satisfies these four properties can be constructed in, in this way. So if you start with any commutative algebra, which is graded, uh, which satisfies like the four properties I just mentioned, then you can realize this algebra as, as the quotient of uh, differential operators with constant coefficients on the first uh, degree component uh, mod out by uh, the annihilator of polynomial F, which is just takes an element of first degree and raises it to the top power. So again, A to the D is an element of the top component, which is one dimensional vector space. And we just choose some identification with R. So they realize this A to the D as a, as a number. And um, therefore, like this F defines a homogeneous polynomial on A1. And if we run this uh, construction, which uh, I just mentioned here, uh, then what you get is an algebra, which is isomorphic to the algebra we started with. Um, Okay, so this construction is not unique. Uh, this is just like one way uh, to reconstruct this algebra, but, in, but uh, uh, um, you can reconstruct algebra A in several ways using this construction. Um, but any algebra can be reconstructed like this. Okay, are there any questions about this thing? Do we know if this algebra is Kazoo? Is it something um, interesting? No, uh, I don't think so. And moreover, we don't know this algebra is Kazul. And um, I mean, you can also ask like some other things like, uh, I guess people in this seminar also care about what Riemann relations and hard left shots. And um, uh, this turns out to be like non-trivial, uh, to non trivial condition on polynomial F. Uh, and this, I, I don't think there is like a good characterization uh, of, of, of polynomials F, which satisfy like this extra properties, but uh, this hard left shots and the hodge riemann relation has to do with Lorentzian property of the polynomial F. Uh, but I don't think there is like a good, uh, it's definitely not even only if uh, condition. Uh, and so, so, so like all, all this more special for casualty, I actually I personally don't know. Uh, yeah, I never thought myself about this, but further properties of this algebra should be some, should satisfy to some further properties of this polynomial, which, uh, yeah, yeah, which I, yeah. Um, okay, any other questions? Okay, if not, uh, let me move on. So the reason, uh, right. So the reason uh, I'm kind of interested in this construction because like these properties one to four, they look like uh, properties which uh, a homology ring of a smooth manifold would satisfy. Well, except of, um, okay, we started with commutative algebra and homology ring is a graded commutative algebra. But if we have even dimensional uh, smooth manifold, we can consider only sub algebra of even uh, degree, uh, even degree cohomologies. And uh, then this subalgebra of even degree cohomologies will satisfy properties one to three. Well, property four is a little bit special, but uh, for today, uh, all all, all cohomology rings we will see will satisfy this. But in fact, like this, the, this commutative uh, commutative construct commutative algebra construction um, doesn't really need this fourth property, or is like generalizations I mentioned later. So and uh, so so the whole. Talk today will be how to um, describe the homology rings and later K theory of certain uh, geometric object using uh, this uh, and similar commutative algebra construction. And uh, we start with a description of the homology ring of toric variety. Uh, so yeah, let me remind a little bit. Um, so we start with a smooth and complete fan, uh, sigma. Uh, so, yeah, if you don't know what a smooth and complete fan, it's just like a fan. Uh, so, there is a correspondence between fan and toric varieties, between fans and toric varieties, and the smooth and complete fan is the one 
for which uh, toric variety is smooth and complete, <laughs> smooth and compact. And you're over C here? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, well, yeah, I work over C. Yeah, if I want to talk about cohomology, yeah, I mean... Or over Q, probably. Uh, well, the, the cohomology will have coefficients over Q or R, but in fact, since I work with smooth case, uh, the same works over Z. But in my in, in all my talk, uh, all cohomology, let's say, will be with coefficients in R, and all varieties will be over C. Uh, again, Great, over, you. You, can, you can do it slightly more general. So, okay, so we have a fan, we have a corresponding torque variety, and uh, like the usual torque geometry um, says that there is a correspondence between cones of our fan and orbits in, uh, uh, so torque variety is an algebraic variety with uh, algebraic toro section, C star to then, and orbits of this torque variety are classified by cones of sigma, um, with reverse, uh, so the dimension of the uh, cone is the co-dimension of an orbit, and in particular, uh, if I, the set of rays of my fan sigma uh, parameterizes invariant divisor. So I usually denote rays by rho 1 up to rho r, and this corresponds to uh, r different invariant divisors in my toric variety. Um, yes. Okay, um, and uh, several facts about the homology ring. So I already mentioned that, okay, uh, I already mentioned that the uh, homology ring is, uh, um, has satisfies Poincare duality, but uh, in the case of toric variety, we're kind of in a good case. Uh, so if we have smooth toric variety, uh, then the uh, homology ring is linearly generated by orbit closures, by classes of orbit closures, in particular, uh, they all even dimensional uh, sub manifolds, uh, real even dimensional sub manifolds. So that means that there are no odd cohomology classes in toric varieties. So the uh, all cohomology ring has only even uh, gradient components. And in particular, it is, uh, sorry, it's, uh, yeah, well, it's always a little bit uh, uh, awkward to write that algebra is commutative and also graded versus graded commutative. But anyway, it's like uh, it's a commutative algebra. It is a graded algebra, and it of course has a zero component and top degree component has one dimensional. And moreover, uh, it's not just uh, it's not just linearly generated by orbits, but it's easy uh, to argue that. Um, yeah, so it's easy to argue that this cohomology ring is actually generated by degree two. Because every orbit you can realize as intersection of uh, of invariant divisors, which in cohomology on, on, on the level of cohomology means that every uh, class of an orbit closure can be represented as a product of uh, classes of codimension of, of of degree two. So um, so what it says that uh, the cohomology ring of toric variety is uh, an algebra which satisfies like these four properties which I mentioned before. So it should come from uh, some construction like this. So it should come as a quotient of differential operators on the second degree cohomology modeled by a uh, homogeneous polynomial, which corresponds to, uh, which is just erasing the degree two class to the top uh, to the top power. And again, like, so yeah, so D to the N is a, um, a little bit switching between cohomology language and maybe algebraic uh, language where like work with choring. So D to the N is a self-intersection index of uh, of the divisor. Okay, any questions so far? I have a lot of questions, but maybe I keep them for the end because maybe it's something well known for everyone here. Yeah, I don't know. Well, I mean, I, I, Guillaume, I think it's actually more useful if you ask questions yeah. uh, now because at the end it will be even harder. So, what is Just the link? The... Okay, so what is the link with the Chow ring? Uh, I oh, thought okay. I thought that toric varieties didn't admit the cohomology ring, and now I'm completely confused. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, toric variety. So I work over C. Uh, so, like an algebraic variety over C. If it is smooth, it's also a, like a smooth manifold. So I can also work with regular cohomology ring. Yes, okay, uh, I see. So in the case of toric varieties, uh, these are the same as Chow ring up to up to grading. Uh, and that uh, has to do with the fact that uh, toric varieties has a, a algebraic cell decomposition. So okay. any 
in particular, like in general, any algebraic variety which can, with torus section with finitely many uh, finitely many uh, fixed points um, satisfies this property that Cho ring is the same as cohomology. So this algebraic construction is the same as topological construction. So I kind of use cohomology here, but as well, you can use uh, everything. You can just change H to A everywhere. And uh, the only thing you need to be careful is the gradings. I see. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, very well. Uh, so, yeah. So what we finish with is like, we have some kind of description like this. One like, the only thing is, is so far it's not very uh, it's not very clear like what's this uh, uh, homogeneous polynomial and since this is kind of some abstract polynomial for now it's not really uh, giving us any uh, new information uh, so the next uh, step would be to actually realize to, so it turns out that this uh, homogeneous polynomial which takes a, a divisor and it erases to the top degree uh, it can be also described in some uh, combinatorial terms uh, and this is uh, uh, done by uh, like a version of bernstein kushnerenko theorem, bernstein kushnerenko holansky theorem. So um, usually then you think about bernstein kushnerenko holansky theorem, it's slightly formulated in a slightly different way, but what I'm going to tell is basically equivalent to the uh, other uh, versions if you uh, heard any, anything else. So, um, okay, so we work on the toric variety. So we have invariant divisors. Uh, so I, I denote them like this. So DH uh, is a divisor, which is a, so D1 up to DR, these are primitive, uh, like these are primitive divisors, uh, primitive inv invariant divisors. So these are orbits, closures at infinity. And I just take a linear combination of this orbit closure. And this is uh, like with coefficients, with coefficients HIs. And this is my general uh, invariant divisor. Uh, and the first of all, uh, the first um, um, the first uh, statement is that every such divisor defines a polytop, which I denote delta H. Well, uh, strictly speaking, this might be a virtual polytop, but uh, I'll comment on this later. So uh, if divisor is ample, um, which basically means that it's like positive enough, um, then the definition of this polytope is, 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 is rather straightforward. So what we do is the following. Uh, so we take all points in Rn such that the uh, inner product within this point and the primitive ray generator Ei uh, is less or equal than Hi. So again, Hi's are these coefficients. So we have of uh, invariant divisors. Each invariant divisor corresponds to a ray in our fan. And what we do is that we take uh, uh, for each ray, we have uh, one inequality. Uh, so we start with, yeah, like this. So for example, in this picture, uh, we have four rays, row one, row two, row three, row four. Uh, and we have four coefficients of uh, invariant orbits, H1, H2, H3, H4. And each of the array defines as an inequality. Um, so we need to take, uh, those vectors which uh, uh, those points in in the plane which have inner product with uh, primitive ray generator or row three with less or equal in uh, h3 and this defines a half space which loops down and we have for this half space as we take their intersection we obtain a polytope okay uh, is it clear so in particular, if we change these numbers HIs, uh, what, the only thing which happens is this uh, corresponding hyperplane, uh, corresponding facet moves uh, in a pair, like uh, moves um, up, like H, like this uh, uh, hyperplane, which corresponds to the uh, ray row three will move up and down uh, in a parallel fashion. And the height will be equal to H3. How is it related to the BKK theorem? I thought it was something about mixed volumes and yeah, yeah, it's of Newton polytope. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So this delta H is a new. You can think about this as a Newton polytope. So the usual uh, BKK theorem is about solving the equations, and uh, but it turns out. I mean, you can also think about this in a uh, more a geometric way as intersecting certain uh, sub varieties of uh, in the torus. 
And then it turns out that you can pass to toric computation, and then this will be actually a computation cohomology ring. And the computation, which I'm going to tell, is kind of without starting from equation, but starting from toric, right? So it's that's how you go from one to another, but maybe I will not tell. Uh, yeah, also we, that's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Um, okay, so this is like this how it works when everything is uh, uh, nice. So, um, but you see what might happen. So I, I try to, uh, so more generally, so I, I try to draw like the same fan and I kept H1, H2 and H3 the same. Uh, and you, you see like in this dashed line where is uh, this uh, previous H4, uh, but now what can happen, let's, let's increase H4. Uh, until it becomes um, uh, H4 uh, prime. Uh, and now, as you see, like, um, um, so if I, if I, if I consider, if I consider uh, literally inequalities I, I wrote before, then uh, the inequality which comes from the fourth ray will not be relevant because um, somehow, uh, because the line uh, which is uh, perpendicular to H4, uh, went away from this triangle bounded by three other lines. So uh, if you just consider, you will get some uh, convex polytop, which is um, just a triangle, but that's not the right thing to do. It turns out that the right thing to do is actually to consider this triangle, the one which you just get from your inequalities, plus or rather minus this extra addition, uh, which is this new triangle, which popped up uh, after, we, uh, after the fourth line um, crossed the intersection of the third and uh, the first line. So the kind of geometric object which you associate uh, to a divisor in this case will be uh, this, uh, like a linear combination of two polytopes. One of them will come with plus, with sign plus one and another with sign minus one. And uh, the, like some easy way to see it is, is the following. Like if you follow uh, the, if you follow your lines, uh, like this uh, lines which are defined by uh, boundaries of your inequalities um, in, in the way that you go from line one, then to line two, then to line three, and then to line four, then you can always uh, go around these four lines in a cycle. And then the cycle, so before the cycle was just uh, kind of embedded into a plane, it was just defined uh, the boundary of your, of your polygon. But in this case, it's not embedded, it's immersed. And uh, um, in particular, it splits uh, our plane in several regions. And then each bounded region um, comes with its own coefficient, which, which is equal to some Winton number. Um, so maybe it's not super important, but what I want to say is that even though, even for divisors which are uh, not ample, you still can associate a geometric object, which is uh, some like this funny virtual polytope. So this thing is called virtual polytope. And then uh, the, this uh, cohomological version of B BKK theorem says that the self-intersection index of the divisor uh, is equal to n factorial times the polytope, uh, times the volume of the polytope delta H. So again, if our divisor uh, were ample, was ample, then the volume is just the volume of a polytope. If it is uh, non-ample, then we need to consider delta H as a virtual polytope. And then the volume will be uh, again, a weighted sum of volumes of uh, different pieces. So here it will be a volume of uh, this bigger triangle minus the volume of the small triangle. Um, okay, so we're at several chambers and each of them has own weight and you sum, sum them up with corresponding weights. Um, okay. So may, maybe let me uh, say, so uh, yeah, so there is like this geometric construction. I didn't really explain it really well. So maybe uh, just to give you some um, more formal but more concrete way to think about it um, is the following. So one way to think about this is the following. So um, the space of virtual polytopes, you should think about this as a, a formal completion. So if I consider, if I fix my fan, I can consider all convex polytopes which have a, a fixed normal fan. Uh, so these convex polytopes, they form a cone because you can take Minkowski addition of these polytopes and you can uh, scale this uh, convex polytopes. Um, and uh, so they form a semigroup. Um, so you can, what you can do, you can formally extend the semigroup to, to, to a group. So this cone to a vector space. 
uh, and this uh, uh, vector space which like uh, which corresponds to it is uh, is another way to think about virtual polytopes so each virtual polytope can be represented as a formal Minkowski difference of two convex polytopes um, and um, so now you can also think about the volume in this way well because the volume on this cone uh, the volume uh, is just the usual volume and uh, it turns out that this is a homogeneous polynomial uh, of degree equal to the dimension of our space and since this is a homogeneous polynomial there is a unique way like it's defined on an open cone in our vector space p sigma so there is a unique way to extend it to the whole uh, uh, to the whole vector space in a polynomial way and uh, like this construction I just told you before uh, just explains how to realize this volume uh, geometrically but you can also think about this purely in purely, purely uh, formal way so uh, there is a, a cone of uh, convex polytopes uh, on this cone uh, there is a well-defined volume just the usual one uh, we can extend this cone to a vector space of formal differences like with usual identification as you go from like a semi group to a group like you need to identify uh, some differences um, and uh, the volume uh, it has unique extension polynomial extension to the whole vector space and this will be the function uh, we need to take yeah okay and uh, just to finish uh, uh, I really forget some letters okay uh, just to finish things together uh, just to finish uh, uh, things just to put them together is um, uh, so what we got is um, uh, that cohomology ring of a toric variety so um, it was the quotient differential operator uh, dif differential operators with constant coefficients on the space of uh, uh, virtual polytopes on the vector space of virtual polytopes uh, by the annihilator of uh, like the self-intersection polynomial but bernstein kushnerka theorem says that this uh, self-intersection polynomial is equal to the volume polynomial on the space of polytopes so this gives like a combinatorial uh, description of uh, cohomology ring of toric varieties w w one of the descriptions okay are there any questions okay well if there are no questions so let me just mention a couple of things uh well first of all uh, there are several generalizations of this theorem um so oh come on i really lose so many letters um, um so theorem um, theorem uh generalizes to full flag varieties uh theorem also generalizes to something called uh, toric bundles uh, so these are certain uh, fiber bundles with toric varieties of fiber um, and also a theorem generalizes to um, something called quasi toric manifolds and these are smooth uh, like these are uh, differential geometric analogs of toric varieties um, yes and in this case uh, the in this case the construction uh, like is slightly more uh general so instead of polytopes so in this last case like this construction is uh, so this some more general objects appear uh so for example in dimension two i will not maybe tell higher dimension but in dimension two uh the role of poly polytope is played by a hyper plane or just a line arrangement uh with extra combinatorial data which is two-dimensional cases just the order of these lines and again if you have any uh, line arrangement in the plane uh with uh, uh like ordered in some way uh, then again you can uh, play the same game you can follow uh, lines in in your order so here for example there is line one we uh we uh, go along line one until we hit line two then we go until line three then we go into line four uh, then until line five until line six and then go back to one so if we follow our lines in cyclic order we get some embedding of the uh, sorry immersion of the circle to to plane and uh, again like it splits my uh, plane in several regions 
And then each bounded region comes with its own coefficient, which is equal to a winding number around this region. And um, uh, so this object, uh, uh, just like these regions with appropriate signs, is called a multipolytope. And it has its own volume, uh, and this volume computes some intersection numbers in quasitoric uh, manifolds, in cohomology of quasitoric manifolds. Um, I, I just want to mention so that this is kind of much more general object because, for example, uh, convex polytope cannot have three uh, parallel sides, but uh, in uh, this multipolytope thing uh, theory, we can uh, consider a lot of uh, parallel sides, et cetera. So this is some something more general. So like here, one, three, and five, lines one, three, and five, they parallel to each other, which is uh, something which is not happening in, in, uh, um, in usual convex polytopes. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so this uh, slightly like in general, multipolytope is a hyperplane arrangement with some extra combinatorial data. Okay. So if there uh, are no questions, let's uh, move on. And uh, um, okay, so and talk to about our uh, our constructions, uh, our description for cohomology rings of toric varieties. So maybe the most uh, well-known uh, description for cohomology ring is not the one which I presented, but rather, um, uh, but rather the one uh, given by a Stanley Reisner ideal and some linear relations. So let me remind how it works. So we start with a, again smooth complete toric variety, and which has R fans, and then the cohomology ring will be equal to a polynomial ring in R variables quotient out by two ideals where uh, uh, one of them is a Stanley Reisner ideal of our fan. So this I uh, is generated by uh, square free monomials, XI1, XIS, uh, which uh, correspond to the uh, collection of rays which do not form a column and sigma. So this is a Stanley Reisner part. And there is also a linear uh, ideal J, uh, which uh, goes like this. So for any element u in Rn, we can uh, uh, construct this linear uh, relation. Um, the coefficient in front of xi is equal to the inner product of u with primitive ray generator of uh, of corresponding ray. So there are two ideals, and uh, like this uh, well known statement is like a homology ring is equal to the quotient of polynomial ring in R variables which we uh, parameterize by our rays again, uh, by this, by the two uh, ideals, I and J. So, um, so now, yeah, I want to, uh, uh, what I want to explain is uh, how this description is related to the one which I mentioned before. And uh, well, in, in fact, I only explain one part. I will explain why uh, both ideals I and J are, uh, belong to this annihilator of volume. Uh, if we identify, yeah, if we identify this polynomial ring with uh, uh, with ring of differential operators with constant coefficient, just by uh, in the most uh, uh, natural way, then it's easy to see that uh, the both ideals belong to annihilator of volume. And the other inclusion uh, is uh, also not very complicated, but this is some um, extra argument which uh, I will not talk about today. Okay, so let's see. So let's start with a linear ideal. So the linear ideal comes from the very easy observation. So if I have my polytope delta, and if I translate it by some vector, uh, then of course my volume will not change. So uh, now if you if you think about it, what does it mean? It means that if I take um, a directional derivative uh, with respect to like this translation by a vector in Rn, then this directional derivative uh, uh, annihilates my uh, volume polynomial because my volume polynomial is constant uh, under translation. So any mm, directional derivative is just uh, infinitesimal, corresponds to infinitesimal uh, translation of my polytope. Uh, like the change of volume under this infinitesimal translation, which is zero. And if you write this directional derivative in this uh, natural coordinates, so in coordinates uh, of 
um, support numbers, HIs, uh, then it's easy to see that this directional derivatives is exactly this differential operator, which is a linear combination of partial derivatives, standard partial derivatives, uh, with coefficients given by inner product of EI uh, primitive rate generator with vector U. So the linear part, just uh, linear part of the ideal is just uh, coming from um, uh, the fact that the uh, volume of polytope does not change under the translation. So the uh, second part, which is Stanley Reisner part, is also easy to see geometrically. And this comes from uh, the following observation. So let's say we just have one uh, partial derivative uh, of the volume with respect to HI. So if we take a partial derivative of a volume and uh, evaluate this partial derivative of some polytope delta, then what we'll get is a, is a volume of, uh, of a facet of our polytope, which corresponds to the uh, ray, uh, to the ith ray. So, um, yeah, so the way to see it is kind of, so um, I try, try to illustrate on this picture. So if you uh, look at this polytope delta H, so if you um, if you increase the i support number by something uh, by t, that means that you basically move the i facet away uh, outside of your polytope. So the difference of two volumes of uh, um, of uh, uh, like delta h and delta h prime is equal to this dashed volume of this dashed area, uh, which is uh, approximately equal to the volume of a facet. So it's approximately equal to the volume of a Perle pipette uh, over the facet uh, Fi uh, and um, of height T. So it's a, it's uh, in the limit, it's a, well, approximately equal to this. So the once you take the limit and the computation of derivative, you get exactly the volume of a facet. <clears throat> um, and in, in a similar way, you can see that if you take the uh, product of partial derivatives with respect to HIs, HIJs um, of the volume and evaluate it at some uh, polytope delta, then what you get is the volume of uh, the intersection of the corresponding facets. And this uh, volume is equal to zero whenever uh, corresponding rays do not form a cone. So you can see how uh, the usual Stanley Reisner ideal comes from this uh, volume polynomial description and also uh, yeah, in this way. Okay, are there any questions so far? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, yeah, maybe it's a good time to have a little break. I don't know how much, what's the usual thing? Uh, well, I mean, we it's up to us, but uh, I don't know, we can just restart at uh, five uh, o'clock uh, Copenhagen time. Yeah, sounds good. But in the meantime, uh, feel free to yeah. ask the speaker questions or something like that. Yeah. I'll stop the recording. Okay, so um, okay, so now let me move on to some uh, uh, to the second construction, uh, which is very closely related, uh, but um, in slightly yeah. Okay, so now I so yeah, so now I'm going to talk about description for K theory of toric varieties. Uh, and this description of K-theory kind of starts the same. So first we start from a purely a commutative algebraic construction of an algebra uh, from a function, but in this case on the lattice. Um, but let me first uh, tell what kind of algebras uh, I am interested in. So um, if I have a commutative algebra uh, and the linear function on this commutative algebra, uh, then um, I can define a pairing uh, on this algebra in the following way. So the pairing between two elements A and B is the evaluation of this line uh, of this linear function at their product. So this is a symmetric bilinear pairing because uh, our algebra is commutative and function L is linear. So since our function L is linear is bilinear, since uh, algebra is commutative, it's symmetric. Uh, 
And uh, we say that uh, this pairing is a Gorenstein pairing if it is non-degenerate. So meaning that for any element where there's a, a different element, like there's another element so that their pairing is not equal to zero. Um, so, so, so the reason for the name Gorenstein pairing is because if algebra A is Artinian, then existence of such pairing uh, is equivalent to the fact that algebra A is a Gorenstein algebra. Um, again, in, ge in general, we not only work in Artinian algebras, so yeah, so that's why, uh, yeah, to, yeah, that's why uh, I call it uh, Gorenstein pairing. Uh, so this pairing is kind of a generalization of Poincaré duality, uh, but uh, for the algebras which do not have grading. So if, if your algebra have a grading, then this uh, linear function L might be any linear function which uh, takes the um, which identifies the top degree uh, component of your gradient algebra with uh, a vector space with one dimensional uh, vector space with with uh, with your field and uh, is equal to zero on every other graded component. And then uh, the usual pairing, which I described to you before for this graded algebra is the same as uh, uh, Gorenstein pairing, more general Gorenstein pairing. Um, and uh, so uh, for this algebra, there is a construction which is similar to the construction of Puchlik of Havansky, uh, which uh, realizes this algebra uh, as a quotient of differential of a, of a ring of differential operators of constant coefficients uh, by an egulator of something. Um, so there are different versions of this construction. So it's usually such construction they call Macaulay inverse systems. Uh, and um, yeah, and there is some uh, some way to make it uh, more concrete, uh, which uh, yeah, which. Uh, which is possible, but I'm not going to talk about this today. Instead, I'm going to talk about slightly different, although this, in, in fact, this is a, a very related construction. Um, okay, so so now I'm going to present some one of a, like a construction which gives you an algebra of a Gorenstein duality. So we start with a lattice, and uh, we start with any function on the lattice. And then we uh, do very similar as we did as we did before. So we what we do we define algebra A G uh, to be the uh, algebral shift operators on this lattice, uh, modeled by an egulator function G. So uh, let me tell more concretely. So if you choose again, if you work with some lattice which is just Z to the n with some basis, then uh, this uh, shift operators. This is just Laurent polynomials in uh, uh, primitive uh, translations, so T1 up to Tn. So the translation Ti or shift Ti uh, just uh, acting on the function G by, uh, by subtracting from its argument the corresponding uh, i-th basis vector. So uh, Ti uh, applied to G related at x is equal to G of x minus ui. And the minus sign is just for, for the conven it's for conventional reason. And of course, you can also add that this will be inverse element. Um, and uh, any shift operator, again, these are shift operators of constant coefficients. These are Laurent polynomials in, in, in this uh, primitive shift TIs, uh, the shifts which correspond to basis vectors in the lattice. And the annihilator, as before, uh, so these are like analogs of this partial derivatives, discrete analog of this. Well, not really. But I don't know. Yeah, it's not really. Um, uh, so, uh, and the annihilator is uh, just again this is the set of all shift operators which uh, which uh, if you apply them to our function g then what you get is identically uh, identical uh, function which is equal to identical ident identical equal to zero so the operators which annihilate our function completely um, yeah, and as before, there is like more uh, the way to think about this what coordinates. So if you have any lattice, not necessarily finitely generated, for example, uh, then uh, by lattice I always mean uh, free abelian group, but not necessarily finitely generated. Then the shift operators you can f identify it with a group algebra over uh, your lattice. Um, so this is like more invariant way to think about it. Uh, but so basically, construction is the same. Instead of the vector space, we have a lattice, 
uh, and instead of uh, differential operators, we have shift operators, but the algebra constructed in a very similar way. We take the uh, ring or algebra of shift operators and quotient by those operators, which completely annihilate our function. And uh, um, there is a theorem, which is uh, parallel to uh, the theorem I mentioned to you before. So first of all, like this uh, quotient algebra AG is a, a, an algebra with Bornstein duality. So first of all, we uh, so annihilator is an ideal, and if you quotient uh, it, and if you if you take this quotient, there is a Bornstein duality on this algebra. But also there is inverse statement as before. So if you have any commutative algebra which is generated by invertible elements. Uh, and which also has a Gernstein duality given by function L, uh, then you can re also realize it as a, using this construction as above in the following way. So you need to take the lattice um, uh, Z to lattice of dimension, which is equal to the number of your generators. And uh, the function on this lattice is given by evaluating. Um, so if I have a vector K inside of this lattice, then uh, my G sends this vector K to evaluation of this linear function L uh, at the monomial A1 to the K1, AS to the KS. So the AI is a generator which, with, which I chosen for me. So if I chose my generators, which are invertible, uh, then any Laurent monomial of these generators makes sense in an element of an algebra. So I can evaluate my linear function, which provides me Gorenstein duality on this monomial. Uh, and this defines me uh, naturally function on the lattice. And if I run this construction on this uh, for this pair, like uh, lattice z to the s with this function, then you uh, obtain your algebra a back. And again, like uh, this might be said slightly more general, like invertible invertibility of elements is not very important, but that's that's let's 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 stick to this generality. Um, Okay, and uh, well, as I said before, uh, the reason why we have seen this construction because it recovers some uh, uh, geometric uh, geometric rings, uh, and namely K. Ah, well, sorry. Before before going further further, let me uh, say a couple of facts about this construction. So uh, first of all, I said that you can run it for any function G. Uh, but to be honest, uh, for generic function, uh, the annihilator of this uh, G is trivial. So the quotient is not very interesting. It's just a round polynomial ring. And um, so in this sense, most, so this word most is not very precise, but you can, you can make it more precise, at least in some cases. So it's really, most of the functions are not interesting at all. However, there is a class of functions which is interesting, and this is a polynomials on the lattices. So if you have a polynomial on a finitely generated lattice, so if G is a polynomial, uh, then this algebra, then the annihilator is not uh, trivial, but moreover, the quotient is finite dimensional as a vector space. So it's a, what you get is an Artinian algebra. So this is maybe like the most interesting example if you have a like a lattice with a polynomial defined on this lattice. Um, yeah. Yeah. But this is not the only example of non-trivial angulator. Like if you just have a one-dimensional lattice and exponential function, this one-dimensional lattice, then annihilator is also non-trivial, but uh, the quotient is not. Yeah, I believe the quotient is not finite dimension as a vector space. Um, okay. So yeah, so let's now uh, move, move back to toric varieties. So uh, this construction uh, should recover some uh, other invariant of a toric variety, namely the K-theory. Um, so let me remind a little bit uh, what is the K-theory. So the K-theory is, um, uh, is, is a abelian group uh, and um, it's constructed as a free abelian group generated by vector bundles over your. So if X uh, is let's say algebraic variety, so then K theory is a free abelian group, which is generated by vector bundles over X, uh, quotient out by the relation, which comes from short exact sequences. So if you have a short exact sequence of vector bundles, um, then, okay, I skipped again the zero. Uh, in the end, then you have that the class of W, which is a, a middle term of the short exact sequence is equal to the uh, sum of a class of U and V. Um, 
yeah so this is some uh, abstract uh, definition uh, but what you get is some abelian group uh, and this abelian group is called uh, k uh, k group of your algebraic variety um, well um, if you work with algebraic varieties sometimes people instead of uh, vector bundles they run the same construction but with uh, uh, sheaves which is more general than uh, vector bundles so um, I, I maybe I always forget what's the right way to put it but uh, when people work with vector bundles I think they have k0 downstairs maybe it's all the way around and then they work with sheaves they have k0 upstairs so they start with three abelian groups of sheaves on your algebraic variety and they model it by the same relation if you have short exact sequence of sheaves then you say that uh, inter middle sheaf is the class of a middle sheaf is uh, equal to the um, sum of uh, classes of two sheaves in the left and the right. Uh, but uh, for us, uh, we will work with a smooth uh, case. And a smooth case, uh, the both uh, constructions actually give you the same thing. And that's because every sheaf on a smooth variety has a uh, resolution by uh, vector bundles. So that means that every class of a sheaf can be in k theory represented as a linear combination of uh, vector bundles so both uh, uh, groups in that are the same and i'll just denote them by k of x um, yeah um, okay so more precisely work with a, a toric variety and for toric variety k theory actually satisfies more properties uh, so again y sigma is a smooth complete toric variety uh, well, first of all, uh, K theory. Okay, yeah, I, I, I'm sorry I didn't write this, but uh, again, then then I, I said that K theory is an abelian group. Uh, but from now on, I, I want to uh, make um, so uh, for uh, for smooth toric varieties, this abelian group is actually torsion free, so it's equivalent. Like if you want to compute the K uh, uh, to K theory of toric variety, it's equivalent to computation of its tensor product with Q or R. So now then I write K of Y sigma, I always mean not the abelian group, but the it's tensor product with R, so it becomes an algebra. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so first of all, it's a community of algebra, uh, whereas the product comes from the tensor product of vector bundles or sheaves. Uh, and it also has a gross, uh, Gorenstein duality. And the Gorenstein duality is uh, given by early characteristic um which is a linear function so early characteristic uh, is like usual sheaf early characteristic of a sheaf uh but uh, it's extended linearly to 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 the combinations of uh to, to linear combinations of uh, classes of sheaves so we have a pairing a earlier pairing on the k theory uh between two sheaves is the earlier characteristic of their tensor product uh, and turns out uh, that uh, such a thing provides a Gorenstein duality on, on, on a toric variety, on the K theory of toric variety. So that means that every sheaf has a, um, has a diff, uh, every sheaf has a, uh, uh, for every sheaf there is another sheaf, which, uh, so that the early characteristic of their tensor product is not non-trivial. Uh, moreover, uh, the K theory of toric variety is generated by line bundles, in particular the uh invertible elements so that means that uh, we should be able to run this construction which i described you before for this k theory so it's a gorenstein uh, algebra of gorenstein duality which is generated by invertible elements so it should come from this quotient of uh, some function on the lattice and uh, which is like this is not very surprising you can describe this again in combinatorial terms um, so for this, uh, we need to remember that each line bundle, uh, well, line bundle uh, corresponds to a divisor, and we already uh, saw that divisors, they correspond to polytopes, and uh, the degree of the divisor was computed in terms of a volume of a polytope, but uh, the early characteristic of the line bundle can be computed as uh, also from this polytope, but now as a number of integral points inside of a polytope. So the only difference here is that uh, the divisor now uh, can have only integer coefficients. Uh, therefore, we obtain not just any polytope, but a lattice polytope or a lattice, virtual lattice polytope. 
Um, and then I say a hard function, it's it's kind of the same difficulty as, as with volume. If I have actual uh, convex polytope, then this is literally just the number of integral points inside of this polytope. If I am in the virtual polytope uh, case, when I need to take, um, uh, first of all, the way uh, you need to be a bit more careful of definition of virtual polytopes, uh, because for volume, you only care about this full dimensional pieces. But uh, in fact, what you need to do, uh, if you count lattice points, you also need to exclude some uh, some lower dimensional uh, chambers as well. Like they also have their own coefficients, but uh, but basically, for every again uh, virtual polytope, uh, for virtual polytope, you can also count the number of integral points inside of them, which is will be some weighted count of points uh, inside of this uh, geometric uh, object you associate to. Uh, not necessarily ample line bundle. Um, and um, this is, is, again, standard uh, result in uh, toric geometry that the early characteristic of a line bundle is equal to the number of integral points inside of a polytope. Or this is also called Erhard function. And again, uh, if you put everything together, uh, this gives you a description of K-theory in, in a completely analogous way as a description of cohomology ring. So the K-theory of toric variety is equal to the uh, shift operators on the lattice of uh, virtual polytopes of a given normal fan, uh, mod out by uh, annihilator of the Erhard uh, polynomial on this lattice. So again, uh, so uh, yeah, P sigma Z is just the lattice of integer virtual polytopes. Uh, and um, Erhard is a Erhard polynomial. So again, you can think if you may be uh, not very, um, uh, so, 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 so if you don't want to think about this geometric construction of this virtual polytopes, you can again think about this Erhard uh, function of the virtual polytope in the formal way. So we have a, we have a lattice of virtual uh, virtual integer polytopes. Inside of this lattice, we have a uh, sub uh, semi group, uh, so that uh, every element is a, of the lattice is a difference of uh, some elements of the sub semi group, and we have a polynomial which is just usual or hard polynomial on this uh, sub semi group, which is like integral points inside of this uh, cone of actual convex polytopes. So this sub semi group is a a convex, a convex uh, lattice polytopes. And uh, there is a unique way to extend this polynomial to the whole uh, lattice uh, just formally. So that's an our way to uh, think about this or hard polynomial on the full lattice. So the same as the volume, you can think about this formally, you can think about this more geometrically. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is a theorem, and, and as before, there is analogous statements for uh, full flags and for toric bundles. Um, yeah, it just follows the same uh, construction. Okay, are there any questions about this? Okay, so let me now uh, continue a little bit further. So, um, okay, first of all, let me uh, describe some uh, special classes in K-theory. Uh, and uh, how you can see them through this construction. So, okay, as before, like uh, we work with uh, like this, now we work with lattice, uh, uh, virtual lattice polytopes uh, with normal fan sigma. And this lattice can be identified with uh, just the Z to the R, whereas R is a number of rays in our cone sigma. Um, and uh, let me just choose, say that the basis of this Z to R is given by U1 up to UR. So this UI is uh, corresponds to the virtual polytope, which has support numbers all zeros except of one non-zero only one non-zero support number at the i-th place. So this is usually a virtual polytope uh, which has uh, uh, height one uh, with respect to i-th row and height zero with respect to all our rows, all our rays. Um, so uh, then. Uh, in K-theory, I already said that there are some line bundles, uh, line bundles which correspond to uh, like uh, polytopes. Uh, so they correspond to these divisors. And this line bundles, just from construction, as a, like the construction before said that these line bundles uh, 
are just monomials in this uh, primitive translations, uh, which is the same as translation with respect to this sum of like yeah with respect to this vector a sum of h i e y. So this is just from constructions um, before. Uh, but the, there are other interesting classes in uh, toric uh, in the K theory of toric varieties, namely there are structure shifts of uh, orbit closures. And uh, it turns out that uh, these classes they also have very natural description in in this uh, in this language of shift operators. Uh, namely, uh, if I have a, let's say divisor di, then this corresponds to i primitive difference operator, so one minus ti. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is like a certain shift operator and um, under the natural identification of uh, under this isomorphism which from the theorem of a quotient of shift operators with k theory these are shift operators which which are mapped to uh, to the structure shift of uh, uh, structure shift of divisors and if you have more generally structure shift of the orbit closure they'll you just need to take the product of these uh, classes uh, Overall uh, rays which uh, belong to our point. Um, so what does it mean? It it kind of means that if you want to compute the what does it mean that uh, this operator corresponds to the structure shift of a divisor? That means that if you want to compute uh, a earlier characteristic of some shift, uh, the tensor product of some shift with respect with uh, structure shift of the uh, boundary divisor, well then what you need to do is you need to apply this. A different separator to the Erhard polynomial and evaluate it at the um, at the um, at the element which corresponds to your original shift. So, kind of uh, in our words, restricting to orbits corresponds to uh, of like shifts to orbits of your torque variety corresponds to application of this uh, primitive different separators to a hard function on your uh, space on your lattice of. Um, uh, on your lattice of uh, line bound, like Picard lattice. Okay, and 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 as before, uh, this uh, you can see also the relations in K theory uh, in very similar way as we saw the relations in polynomial in in cohomology ring. So if I have a polynomial, um, if I have a polytope delta, well, again, the Hart function does not depend on the translation. So if I translate my polynomial by integer vector my hard function will stay the same so uh moreover like the support numbers if i translate as before if i translate by some vector x then the support numbers change in very predictable way so new support numbers equal to the old support numbers plus the inner product of x with uh, primitive ray generator uh so therefore their hard function of uh, delta is equal to the hard function of well delta translated by delta but uh delta translated by x uh, a hard function of delta translated by x is equal to the application of this primitive uh translations uh this many times uh so if you apply this product of differential operators a product of this primitive translations you get literally the same function so therefore like this difference of uh, one minus this product is uh a shift operator which annihilates the hard function for any uh, for any integer vector x. So this is an analog of a linear relation cohomology that's kind of exponentiated linear relation cohomology, which uh, appears in K theory. Uh, and the explanation is exactly the same as before. And similarly, you can see also um, uh, Stanley Reisner analog of Stanley Reisner relations so there's also kind of a deformation of Stanley Reisner relations uh, also in very similar way so um, if you want if you start with this primitive uh, difference operator just take one minus ti and apply it to a hard polynomial uh, and a related at some polynomial uh, delta then what you get is a hard function of 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 a facet which corresponds to i ray so it's very easy to see geometrically so uh, in this picture, you have uh, delta of H, which is like this big polytope, and delta of H, um, uh, where I where I, where I, uh, we um, uh, decreased one of the support numbers by one, 
uh, this is the dashed uh, uh, polytope. And this is exactly the polytope uh, of uh, which we get after applying TI to a heart function. So the difference of two heart functions is exactly so only those all the integral points which are in big polytope but not in a small one are the ones which belong to the facet fi. So this is uh, even easier than the case of uh, uh, volumes because you don't need to need pass to limit. You just see it right away. And uh, in particular, like slightly more general, if you apply the product of these different separators to your heart polynomial, then what you get is a heart function and a related sum polytope delta. And then what you get is a heart function of the intersection of this facet, uh, which vanish if um, the corresponding facets do not intersect, which is equivalent to the fact that corresponding rays do not form a cone and sigma. So therefore, the product of this difference, primitive difference operators, is also in angulator if the corresponding rays do not form a cone and sigma. And this is an analog of the standard Reisner uh, relation in uh, cohomology, but in K-theory. So again, it's kind of similar like this. Diff so this looks even easier in the sense because like it's just instead of partial derivative, we have these difference operators. So that's um, that's the uh, way it works. Um, and also, I mean, I mean, this fact is not very surprising that like this uh, this equation holds because, as I told you, uh, like these different operators, they should correspond to a structure shape of 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 divisors. So, application of this different separator heart function should correspond to restricting our uh, our sheaf uh, to to the divisor. And if you have a line bundle which corresponds to the polytope of delta, if you restrict it to a uh, invariant divisor, this will be also in equivariant line bundle, but on uh, toric variety of dimension n minus one, and the polytope of this line bundle will be exactly the face, uh, the corresponding facet of your poly of your original polytope, and the Euler characteristic. Uh, is exactly the computation of uh, number of integral points inside of this uh, phase by usual uh, toric um, toric uh, uh, geometry. Uh, and again, so so far I just constructed two ideal. So I constructed two uh, relations which belong uh, uh, which belong to my annihilator. So, uh, but in fact, you can show that these are the only relations which you can which you can actually see. Which you actually see in uh, uh, in uh, in K theory, and therefore you obtain uh, uh, like a presentation of K theory, which is th this presentation is also is, is known. It's uh, which is analog of a Stanley Reisner, uh, which is analog of a Stanley Reisner a presentation of cohomology ring. So it's again generated by two idealists. So it's quotient of Laurent polynomial ring. In R variables, where R is a number of rays, quotiented out by two ideals. One of them is an analog of a linear ideal. So this is like exponentiated version of linear ideal in cohomology. So you have a monomial of xi to the power ei uh, in a product with ui, with u, sorry, where ei is a primitive ray generator of corresponding ray and u is any integer vector. Uh, so you have ideal generated by these guys. And you also have an analog of a Stanley Reisner ideal where you take the product of this elements one minus x i j's. So these are in 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 this uh, this analogs of this. These are different. These correspond to different separators, and uh, you take those ones uh, which correspond to the collection of rays which do not form a cone in sigma. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay, if there are no questions, let me just finish with a couple of things. So, okay, I, I will not talk about case of the uh, uh, of the case of the flag varieties, but in the case of flag varieties, um, first of all, like the description goes uh, um, basically in the same way, um, and. Uh, in the case of flag variety, you now think so. In the case of toric varieties, the inter the, inter the interesting classes are orbits, but it's it's kind of it's kind of a baby example. But uh, in case of flag varieties, there are actually interesting example uh, interesting classes in K theory, which are uh, structure shifts of Schubert varieties. And it turns out that you can also give a very concrete description of these uh, uh, classes in terms of this uh, shift operators uh, algebra. 
um, which has to do something with uh, combinatorics of glyphon and polytopes. And um, yeah, so this is um, kind of uh, part of the uh, work, but maybe let me not talk about this. And maybe the last comment is uh, that, okay, so um, one, one, one motivation for, for like this description, which I presented is, uh, so the description by generators in relation is not very functorial. So namely, if I have, let's say two toric varieties, uh, which correspond if I have like a fan and if I have a subdivision of this fan, uh, this give me a, a, tor a different toric variety uh, with a uh, with a map to original one, and um, uh, it's not so easy to see how uh, how different how cohomology rings or k k rings of uh, of these two toric varieties are related if you just purely look at the uh, generators and relation things because it's uh, like these ideals they kind of they depend on all rays which uh, which you have, and it's not so easy to see how to go from like one cohomology ring to another. Uh, and this description via the uh, shift operators and hard polynomial or uh, differential operators in volume polynomial is much more functorial because the uh, polytopes with normal with smaller normal fans they appear as also polytopes uh, with a, a larger normal fan, and um, there is a natural kind of embedding of uh, one uh, cohomology ring into another, and in particular, you can take like the direct limit of all of this uh, of all of these algebras. And in the case of cohomology ring, this direct limit was actually studied before, so this is called the ring of conditions. Uh, well, ring of conditions def defined a much more general case uh, for spherical varieties, but for tor for, to for torus for algebraic torus, so ring of conditions is some intersection theory which you can define for homogeneous spaces. Which are not compact, so it's it's a it's a certain uh, intersection theory which works well even though your homogeneous space is not compact. For example, for uh, for torus itself, uh, the usual Cho ring is trivial, but there's still kind of non-trivial intersection theory happens, and the ring of condition is the ring which is responsible for this intersection theory, and uh, this ring is exactly equal to direct limit of all possible toric quantifications of the toric varieties. Um, and uh, like this volume polynomial description is more convenient in this case because uh, it gives you very uh, concrete way to describe it. And similar for uh, K theory, like uh, this description by Erhard polynomial gives you a way to consider this uh, direct limit uh, in the very natural way. So what you need to do is just in, instead of taking virtual polytopes with a given normal fan, you just take all possible virtual polytopes. This is a uh, this is a lattice. Um, this is a lattice. It's infinitely generated. It's not finitely generated anymore. But as I mentioned before, like the whole theory uh, goes through. So you just take this. Uh, sorry, yeah, I missed again. So you don't take just the lattice. You take the shift operators on this lattice, and you take the annihilator by uh, quotient by all those shift operators which annihilate the hard function or hard polynomial on this infinite dimension, infinitely generated lattice. And what you get the, is like this universal uh, K ring of this, uh, of all toric varieties or kind of K theoretic ring of condition. So I, I uh, yeah, I'm not sure people considered this before, but uh, I, uh, yeah, this is, okay, maybe let me stop here. Yeah, uh, other questions? Yeah, so let's thank the speaker. Um, yeah, and if there are any questions, uh, please feel free to ask them. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's not clear to me what you're taking the limit of just this this last limit you're writing Is uh, yeah. it on the all the refinements of the normal fans. No, uh, these are all uh, these are all yeah, yeah. it's um, limits. So I need like a, a how it's called uh, a how it's called directed system. Or ordered system and my ordered system are all toric varieties like all fans and a uh, under refinement uh, relation under refinement okay great yeah. Um, yeah. So. yeah yeah um yeah so people have studied uh, some affine characteristic classes which are some version of characteristic classes for 
um, again in this ring of conditions so in this cohomology version of this and um, this k theoretic one might be somehow related to which might be some ring and roll kind of theorems which relate in k theoretic ring of condition and um, um, the usual ring of condition also i i have to say that um although i well i didn't think very carefully about this i think k like you can define this ring of condition k theoretic ring of condition intrinsically as uh, like similar to the way ring of condition is defined and then like it would be theorem that this intrinsically defined ring of condition is equal to this uh, direct limit but this is something i didn't think through uh, carefully uh, but it's one of the possible other questions okay any other questions okay if not i will stop the recording <laughs>